appreciate your patience. But there's apparently sicknesses going around. Some our, our, our regularly scheduled soloist was deathly ill today, and uh, apparently he tried to get out of bed, and that didn't go so hot. So we're keeping him in our thoughts as well. So, so this is this is a song that I felt like doing a little differently today. So I just put some drums to it. I was like, oh, I like that. So we're doing it. And this is a song. Uh, this is a song that uh, I wish I had been able to play for a friend of mine. Um, uh, and so. I just put this out as a message that if, not this song in particular, but the message of this song, my new rule of thumb is when in doubt, share the message of this song. So it seems you're still in doubt You're looking like there's no way out Of these blues that's got you down well, I'm glad I'm still around I know a little something too A little something I've been through That might pertain to you God will bring you happiness again 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 Stuck sleeping with your past She's dead and buried But you want her to last And you think you'd better get a grave too But that's not something you should do Cause the future will be your lover too And the past She's not the jealous kind She won't mind God will bring you happiness again 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 of the eyeliner. <laughs> wow. I wasn't expecting that today. Um, unexpected can be good. Unexpected can be awesome. Um, it's interesting what that, what that song reminded me is um, 
recently got to stand up in front of the Prescott City Council and stand in support of a proclamation declaring that September is National Suicide Prevention Month. And as Jackson was speaking, what was echoing in the back of my head was, when in doubt, reach out. So if there's somebody feeling very alone in the world, the be and especially if that person is you, the best thing you can do is just try one more time to reach out to one more person. If you see somebody who is standing up and making it look good, that might be the person you need to reach out to. And just to be sure about it, we reach out to everybody all the time, right? That's got our bases covered. Because nobody was intending to go to work tomorrow and get anything else done, right? Ha, <sighs> okay. Nice, heavy moment for me there. Um, I will tell you that Quad City Interfaith Council is working to put together a program called Safe Talk that helps people be in support and helps them connect with each other. So if that is something that you or somebody you know could use, please have them call me during the week and we will talk about what, what we can do to support our brothers and sisters out there that we may or may not know yet. So, A Swiftly Shrinking Planet is the name of our talk today. And for those of you who don't understand why that sounds a little familiar, if you saw that movie with Oprah in it recently, the one about um, tesseracting and A Wrinkle in Time, that's part of a series, and one of the books was A Swiftly Tilting Planet. And it took me forever to figure out that that's what I was referring to when I named that talk. So just so that all of my angst and what the heck am I doing doesn't go to waste, I'm sharing that with you. Because the truth is this planet might feel like it's shrinking sometimes, yes? We have a 24-hour news cycle here. And we can hear about things going on on the other side of the planet before that person's parents find out. And I went to college in a town and, and actually met my husband in a town where he couldn't do anything in the entire southern half of the state without his parents finding out. So if you don't think pre-Google era had really fast transmission of information, try and get away with something in a small town. Anybody relate to that? Yeah, yeah, we happen to live in a small town, guys. Ernest Holmes, who is the founder of our philosophy, was really big on us understanding that there is only one capital R reality. We each have our own experience of reality, but really, there's only one thing in the universe. There is one power, one presence, one, one, one. He wrote, there can be, there can be no two infinites because chaos and not cosmos would be the result. If that is all there is, that oneness, where would you find a line except an imaginary one? The lines between us and them, the lines between the in-group and the out-group, we made those up. The line between us and our good. Here's a thought experiment for you. I want you to imagine right now a globe of glass. It is a perfect globe and there is one tiny little hole in the top for air. Within that globe, there is a goose. Can you picture it? Without breaking the glass or harming the goose, how do you get it out? Can't break the glass, can't harm, Daniel? You take out, no, it's one perfect globe. There is no seam in there, there is no cork. Thought, exactly. You imagine it out, that's how you got it in there in the first place. <laughs> Ernest Holmes wrote, because of indivisibil indivisibility, unity is a necessity. Unity is a necessity, not sameness. We all get to have our own experience. We all get to celebrate each other's very distinct and unique beauty. 
But that oneness is an absolute necessity. The laws of physics don't work any other way. I remember being in uh, honors chem back in high school and him talking about how this seems to be solid, this seems to be solid, but when I put my hand down on it, at some level, the electrons are kind of passing through each one. And there is, at the quantum field, a oneness going on right here. I can still lift my hand away. I'm not going to be stuck standing here for the next week. But there is an essential oneness that exists at the physical level, at the spiritual level, at the emotional level, as we reach out to each other, as we form what I call soul conversations. You know, it's that, that conversation that's happening underneath the discussion of the weather that happens, you know, when old friends are telling their in-jokes. They don't even have to say most of it. Maybe the punchline, maybe they just, you know, if you've seen married couples who are happy together after 40 years, they, they can just look at each other and then they crack up because they went through that whole joke with an eye twitch. That actually is kind of my new mental equivalent of friendship. <laughs> so if you make my eye twitch, you know you're my friend? Wait, that's just wrong. There is, however, uh, a sense in which we have known that truth long before we were able to prove it uh, using quantum physics. There is an ancient Buddhist who is attributed with this particular idea. His name is Tu Shun. Well, Tu Shun. I know I'm mispronouncing it, and I apologize. He lived from 557 to 640 BC. So about a half a century before the Christian era started, this particular gentleman who taught Mahayana Buddhism taught about something called the net of Indra. Has anyone heard of that? Some of you have heard of that. Awesome. So the net of Indra asked you to imagine a vast net, hence the name. And at every point in the net where two pieces of, of the string of the net cross, there is a jewel. That jewel is a person. And each one sparkles in its own way, and each one reflects the other's light. So if you want to see your own light as a jewel on this particular net, as a priceless piece of the universe, you look into the light of the jewels that are living right next to you. And trust that that same light is reflecting in the different facets of the jewels of the people on the other end of this infinite net. That is what Indra's net talks about and this essential oneness that we all live. Actually, each jewel can also represent an atom, a cell, or a unit of consciousness, not just a person. Whatever level you want to work this metaphor at, it works. Any change in one gem is reflected in all the others. This has been proven by quantum physics over and over again. There's all those cool experiments out there where they get two uh, photons to connect to each other and then they put them on opposite sides of the room and they spin one photon in a direction and the other photon spins in that same direction. You spin this photon in the other direction, this one's gonna turn around too. That is the pure scientific explanation of quantum physics. <laughs> a la Reverend Kathleen. If you would like a better explanation of um, the Vedas and how all of these theories work. On September 15th, there is a Swami whose last name, I forgive me, I can't pronounce, it's something Ananda, um, that was referred to us by one of my dear friends in ministerial school. And he will be here talking about the Vedas and how they influence the thought of not just Hinduism, but Buddhism and present day thought. Um, so he's going to take us through a couple exercises and it's a two hour, 10 to, two, uh, 10 to 12, I can do math, 10 to 12 uh, for a love offering. In order to be a jewel that is, per, that is reflecting the light as opposed to the shadow of any jewel, 
the the requirement from each and every one of us is something called pluralism. Pluralism says that you could have two concepts that have nothing to do with each other and might even seem to negate each other existing in absolute truth at the same time right next to each other. So for instance, it is entirely possible to be a good Bible-believing Christian who is friends with a good Torah-believing Jew. Did you know that? You can have friends who disagree with you about stuff. I've heard there are places in the country where Republicans and Democrats get along too. <laughs> I'd like to believe that we are one of those places, that we can come together and honor the light in each other without needing to agree on all the details and without needing to fix anyone else. So the definition of pluralism is a condition or system in which two or more states, groups, principles, sources of authority, etc., coexist. We say we honor all paths to God. We light the candles to remind ourselves that we don't own the trademark on truth. God is not a member of just this one congregation. If the divine is infinite, it gets to choose a different place every Sunday. And if it's infinite, you can go to all of us every single Sunday or Friday or Wednesday. Yes? Okay. In order to allow pluralism to exist effectively, in order to shine the light through all the jewels on Indra's net, we have to be willing to look past what seems different and see the truth of our oneness. So here's another thought experiment. In the days of the Roman Empire, there was a group of people, a, a cult essentially, and the Romans were kind of tearing their hair out because this group that existed in, in secret were purported to be cannibals. <laughs> They had this teacher, and they ate him. <laughs> and they went around pulling other people in and teaching them the same type of behavior. They not only ate him, they drank his blood. Ew. This is long before Bram Stoker's Dracula. This is long before, you know, one of those gorgeous hotties from Hollywood decide to make this into a fun story or a silly story in some cases. But these poor Roman, basically, cops were going nuts trying to find these cannibals. The cannibals called themselves Christians. And I just described communion as an outsider might see it. Can you imagine if we heard about a cult today that was like, first of all, how would you get any of them into ministerial school if their leaders were going to get it? <laughs> it kind of makes all my bed and Jerry's a sacrament because I want to feed more of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not signing up for that, thanks. So there's one that works. Let's try it from the other direction where we know the name, but we may or may not know who they really are. Who here has heard of Satanism? Okay, here, who here has had a friend who was a Satanist? Oh my God. <laughs> I am so proud of you. Satanism actually, do you know that Satanism has denominations within it? that there's different temples and churches. There's the temple of Satan, and then there's the church of Satan, and they don't get along any better than the Baptists and the Mennonites, or the Catholics and the Protestants in England once upon a time. They have potlucks. They have youth ministry. They have social justice ministry. And some of them think the other groups are, are far too soft and hippie-ish and not uh, sticking with doctrine enough. 
As I was taught it, the primary rule of Satanism is very close to another word that often gets used to create the other, which is witches. And it harm no innocent, do what thou wilt. There is a pagan belief that it, and it harm none, do, what you, do whatever you want to do, so long as you're not hurting anybody. In Satanism, they say, and it harm no innocent, which means that if there is someone who is being inappropriate, those people can be punished by the state. Oh my God, we're Satanists. We're all Satanists. If you believe in supporting the cops and locking up criminals, surprise, they're not as other as we thought they were, are they? I mean, they have potlucks, people, come on. At one point, in order to support uh, the gay and lesbian community, they had a movement going all on called Hashtag Satan Cakes. They went to the places where people were refusing to bake cakes for gay weddings or for marriage equality and requesting cakes with the image of Satan on them. And because it's a religion, it's a protected class. So they have rather a, should I say, devilish sense of humor. <laughs> Sorry. Not really. And actually, the whole idea of Satan comes from, it's pre-Christian, but it's a Judeo-Christian idea. The word Satan was not originally a proper name. It was not, you know, the son of the morning, Lucifer, falling from the sky because he wanted to have an, his own opinion. It was just a noun, and it meant the adversary. In the book of Job, the adversary is kind of like the prosecuting attorney. Satan is the DA. And I'm not just saying that because I used to work for the public defender. It appears in the book of Samuel. David, King David, our guy is presented as the Satan or adversary of the Philistines. And in the book of Numbers, it's a verb. God sent an angel to Satan, Balaam, to oppose this other God. So what if those weirdo hippies down the street who... <laughs> I had one of them just wave to me. <laughs> Those people that you just don't get and you sure as heck don't get their music. You don't understand why they won't eat meat and come to a barbecue with you. You don't understand why they have to grow the, what they call wildflowers and you call weeds, in their yard to protect all the little bunny rabbits. They are the other. The human mind is set up to group information so that we don't have to learn everything all over again every day. And the human mind is also set up to push those boundaries out, to learn new things. If we were not possible to learn new ways of thinking, this philosophy would not work. We change our thinking, which changes how we react to the world, because we think it means something when X, Y, or Z happens, or somebody is called a Satanist, or somebody's called a witch, or one of those cannibal Christians. We think it means something, but if we can understand and learn that it might mean something else, then our reaction to it will be different and our life will change. Our life will change when we change our thinking. It starts a whole domino effect. What if that person that you have spent your life criticizing harshly, understanding every way that they fail, that would be the person in the mirror. What if that person wasn't so bad? What if that person had strengths that you have not yet understood? And because they might have been inconvenient, you know, I can't remember the name of the woman, but uh, there was a young girl who could not sit still in class. And I could hear all of you teachers going, yep, 
I know that kid. Male and female. It's inconvenient when one kid out of 32, yes, we're up to like thir in the th low 30s these days, will not sit still and do the work. So this kid's mom took her to a shrink. I can say shrink because that's my past life. Um, psychologist. Who left her alone and just kind of observed her for a few minutes and left a radio playing. For those of you who are very young, a radio was something you turned on to get music and it didn't just exist in the car. It's kind of like Pandora. It used to be a separate box from your computer. Um, sorry, my nephew discovered a tape the other day and he ha had to have explained what it was. <laughs> so he turned on the radio and this kid started getting up and dancing. And so the psychologist very wisely said to the mom, she's not sick, she's a dancer. And she became one of the great American dancers and choreographers of the 20th century, and forgive me, I can't think of her name. But I read it on the internet, so it must be true, right? No, I, I can hear other people kind of muttering her name, so I know that she's real. This is a shrinking planet. And the point is that we have new neighbors. It used to be kind of like we lived on great big farms and there was plenty of space and we really only saw people from our own family. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the 21st century. We all have apartments now. We can't help but know our neighbors and the music they listen to and smell what they're making for dinner. It's a much smaller world and it's getting smaller. Bless you. In the year 1800, there were a billion people on the planet. Now there's 7.6 billion people on the planet. There's a Harvard University sociobiologist named Edward Wilson who says that if everyone agreed to become vegetarian, leaving little or nothing for livestock, which is said to be the most effective and economical use of land, of arable land that there is, the present 1.4 billion hectares of arable land, 3.5 billion acres, would support about 10 billion people. We're growing at 1.1% per year. Empirical data from 230 countries since 1950 shows that the, gr well, that's, I skipped. We expect to have 10 billion people pretty darn soon. So nine or 10 billion and I don't know about you, but sometimes that 24-hour news cycle freaks me out with that information. The part that they leave out is that as groups become more educated, they tend to have small, and richer, they tend to have smaller families. They don't need as many children because all of them are gonna to survive to adulthood. When most of the kids die in childhood, yes, you're gonna have a ton of kids. However, it appears since 1950, the great majority of the 230 countries that have been studied, fertility rate is declining. And so basically what's happening is that um, we're getting down to each family has, believe it or not, not 2.5 kids, but 2.1. I still haven't seen that 0.1 kid. I don't understand. But that's pretty much... Basically, we're just replacing ourselves every generation instead of growing. So there is hope for us, but that's a lot of people in one space, yes? Has anyone noticed that it now takes about half an hour or more to get from Prescott Valley to Prescott? Some of those 10 billion people are moving in here. And some people are worried about water and resources and all this other stuff. And in order to figure out a way to work together and share the bountiful resources of the earth, we might have to talk to some people that we wouldn't have expected. There might be stuff out there in the world that can benefit us if we will just talk to someone who is different than us. A few years ago when California was in such a horrible drought, does anyone remember that? Was anyone living in California at the time? Because, man, a lot of y'all have moved here. And that's awesome, because I'm one of them. But... <laughs> 
President, then President Obama reached out to the Israelis for help. And this group of people who were living, have turned a desert into farmland, were able to send some of their technology and their ideas and figure out what would work in California. Now in Israel, they recycle 87% of their water and they have desalination. And no, no part of this is necessarily new stuff. But they have figured out ways to make it work. What if the water shortage, which isn't really a water shortage on this planet, is we haven't gotten creative enough to make sure that everybody has access to clean water. What if that was fixable with the technology we have right now? But all we have to be willing to do is reach out to people we may have some preconceptions about. What if the exact thing we need to do to make renewable energy came from the people that, you know, during World War II, they were our enemies? During World War V, maybe they'll be our allies. Hope we never find out. <clears throat> there are so many places in the world where if we will just drop our preconceptions, good can happen. One of the places this happens also is that we can turn that around. Do you know just by being born and raised here in the USA, by living here now, you are part of the top 13% of the richest people on the planet? Did you know you were like almost part of the 1%? Kill. We have a lot more resources than we thought we did. One of the resources we as a community have is some land around us and there's about to be more. And I happened to meet a gentleman by the name of Patrick Grady who spoke to our board at the last board meeting and invited to become us to become one of the original groups doing this pilot, pilot project called Harvest of Care Gardens. If we will take some of our land, like, heck, the stuff that's being watered out in the back right now, and plant veggies, and promise to give 50% of that crop to a local food kitchen, they will support us by helping us organize our volunteers, they will give us access to expert gardeners. They will um, help us distribute the food. If that is a program we're interested in doing, we have some resources, they have some knowledge, and our neighbors have a need. When we bring those things together, what happens is the opportunity to meet our neighbors and get to know some of the other people on, in this town in a whole new way. And to perhaps partner with, this is a, a, a project that's being done by a group called Arizona Interfaith Power and Light. I know it sounds like APS basically, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it's about uh, food, food justice. <clears throat> There's a sign up sheet out there. If you want to be part of that project, then we need a hard commitment. What does a hard commitment look like? It means you put your name on there and say about how much time per week, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, you would like to work in the garden as needed. There's gonna be times when the only thing to do is, you know, for one hour a week, somebody needs to, you know, a total of one hour across the week, somebody needs to make sure it's getting watered. If you're willing to be part of that, if you want to be part of that, there's a sign-up sheet out there and I will get back and see that uh, our application for this project goes through. If no one wants to do it, maybe that's not our project and that has to be a legitimate answer to this set of information. But if it is our project, I wanna give you the opportunity to come play. If you're like me and have managed to kill invasive weeds, Perhaps it's not yours to be like in charge. But even I can go and learn things and eventually like grow actual mint in my garden. You know mint's an invasive weed? It didn't survive me. How is that possible? Oh my gosh, there might be something new for me to learn about myself as a gardener. Wouldn't that be lovely? All right, so if you're into that idea, please join me. 
And whether you're into that particular idea or not, there is an idea called the divine that we share here. And 